Christos Trampolidis from uh, UBC in Vancouver. I already forgot how to use Zoom. Yeah? Recording in progress. Right, and he's gonna talk about imbalance trouble. Christos, the floor uh, is yours. Good, thank you, Marco. Um, let me hide this. Okay. Uh, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the for the invitation. Um, good pleasure to to be here. I've I've, I've attended the previous uh, workshops online and uh, always thought it's a great it's a great venue. Um, all right. So today I'm gonna talk about uh, very recent work. So actually this is something that is unpublished and hopefully it will be soon on archive and it's joint work with uh, uh, my students, uh, Ganesh, who is at uh, UCSB in Santa Barbara and uh, Valentina, who are at uh, UBC. Uh, Val is actually an, under an undergrad and he's now starting his graduate studies. Okay, um, so the motivation for for this talk comes from the from the common knowledge nowadays that large models generalize better. Okay, and uh, and this is something that is depicted in this um, in this uh, plot. Um, this is somewhat outdated. This is a plot from 2019, but it already shows the trend that uh, some of the uh, networks that generalize the best that achieve the best um, top one accuracy are such that the number of parameters that they train is much larger than the size of the training data set. And when I say much larger, it's uh, on the order of 10 or 20 times, right? And, and of course, this trend has, uh, has exploded over the recent years. And really, I guess the holy grail question here is uh, how, how, why do these models generalize well, okay? Uh, and there's lots of work on people trying to understand that. And, um, and perhaps a conceivable step um, in this direction, one of many, is, is, is to try to answer this question. Uh, what are the structural properties, if any, of the solutions that are learned by these large models? Okay. And so what I mean here by structural properties, um, I want to, to, to know whether there is some specific geometry that is being learned uh, in terms of the, of the weights of the, of the neural network. And I will specify, I will make much more concrete this question, but, but at a high level, this is, this is the question. Okay, and, and, and so in order to, to specify the question, let, let's consider K-class classification. So uh, supervised K-class classification, um, very standard setting. Uh, we're given N training data. These are pairs of feature vectors and labels, Xi, Yi. Um, Xi's are, say, images, so these are p-dimensional vectors, and I have K-classes. And the goal is to learn a model, uh, f of theta, that is a mapping from uh, the space of images from the p-dimensional space to the k-dimensional space that is parameterized by theta. So theta here is the vector of, of weights. And the prediction is, is done according to the majority wins all rule, which says that you look at the um, entries of, of this, uh, of this um, model evaluated at a data point, at a feature vector, and um, and then you pick the, the largest one and, and you declare this as your, uh, as your class. Okay, uh, now how do neural networks learn such, uh, such mappings? Okay, so they take as input um, examples, xi, uh, and they learn an embedding map, um, h of theta, that is parameterized by, uh, by, by previous uh, weights. Um, and, and this h of theta, this learned embedding, it has a hidden dimension that uh, we'll be calling d. Okay, so these are the embeddings. And then once you have the embeddings, what do you do? Essentially, you do linear classification. Okay, so, so once you have the embeddings, then you, you just have K classifiers for K classes, K vectors, K dimensional vectors, which you stack in this, uh, in this matrix uh, that is D times K dimensional. And then essentially, the, the, the overall model takes this form. It's W transpose times H theta of X. Uh, and, and sometimes people call these the logits, okay, the outputs of the, of the neural network. Now, the whole point of neural network training that is different from, say, support vector machine classification is that you are jointly training the classifiers and the learned embeddings, okay? Uh, and, and typically, if you are doing um, key class classification, perhaps the first um, choice for your loss would be um, this cross-entropy loss, okay? 
All right. So, and also tra training here is being done with respect to the parameter state of the hidden of the hidden um, uh, embeddings and and the classification vectors W. Okay. So in this talk, what we will do is we will we will assume we will rather view uh, the entire network as a black box, and we will isolate our attention at the last layer. So at these embeddings that you learn and at the classifier. And the question that, that um, we will be asking is what is the geometry of the land embeddings and of the classifiers when over-parameterized neural networks are trained with stochastic gradient descent until um, zero crescentric loss. Okay. Um, and so in particular, what, what I mean here by geometry is we want to know whether there is something that we can say about the norms and the angles of, of these vectors. Okay. And, and at this point, this question seems rather optimistic to, <laughs> to, to have an answer because as you can imagine, uh, the answer could potentially depend on many things. It could depend on the specific architecture. It could, it could depend on the nature of the data set. It could depend on the specific even um, realization of, of the stochasticity of the algorithm. Um, despite that, there is, a, there is a result by Papian, Han, and Donohoe in 2020, which they call the neural collapse phenomenon, which to me is, uh, is quite um, surprising. And, um, and a very nice formalization. So, so the authors made the following empirical discovery. Um, they said that under the assumption that all classes have the same number of examples, the geometry of the classifiers and of the learned embeddings is characterized by the following two properties. The first property is the neural collapse property, and the second property is, is this angular tight frame proper property, which I will be calling ETF property uh, for short. And let's, let's, uh, I will tell you what these two properties are. Okay, so let's start with the first property. So the NC property says that embeddings of examples belonging to the same class C collapse to their class mean embeddings mu C. Okay, so this is the equation for it, but let's see in a, in a sketch what this means. So if I look at the, at the original space of images, okay, say in, a, in an instance when I have four classes and I have, I guess, six examples uh, per class, then the images on this space might look like that, okay? And then for, for each class, there is a corresponding mean. And, and around this mean, there is somewhere there is the, the examples. Now, what, what neural collapse says is that if I look at the same picture after training, so if I look now at how the embedding space looks like, then the picture would look like that, okay? So there is now, now the, the learned embeddings are concentrating uh, towards their, uh, their means. Okay, and, the, and this is what this equation um, shows. And so here, convergence is with respect to the training epochs. Okay, so, so um, um, when uh, training continues, this, this type of picture should, should emerge. All right, what about the ATF property? So the ATF property is, is much stronger. It says something specific about the geometry of the learned uh, classifiers. Uh, so the first, the first sub-property, rather, is that these classifiers lie in a K-minus one dimensional subspace. So here I'm showing you how the, the geometry would look like for four class classification. So four class classification, I can draw it in, 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 in R3. So I have four classifiers. They all have the same norm. So you can see here that they all lie on the same sphere. And they are all maximally separated in space. Okay, so, so the cosine of their angle is, has this value of minus one over K minus one. Um, and so, in, in matrix form, what this means is that if I look at this gram matrix, W transpose W, then it converges to, to, to this matrix, which is essentially a scaling of identity minus this rank one component of one, one transpose, okay? Uh, and, and, and what about the embeddings? Um, the embeddings will converge exactly to the, to the, to the same geometry as the, as the classifiers, and specifically, they will align with the classifiers, okay? So these are the two properties, NC property and TTF property, and at this point, these are just, um, Formalizations, right? They're, they're hypotheses. Uh, and so then, once, once the authors um, uh, did that, what, what they did is they, they formed appropriate metrics and they tried to verify through experiments whether this holds. Okay? And so here is, uh, here is our replicated experiments for, for the NC property. So what we did here is rather just following, of course, their, uh, their suggestions. Uh, we take the deviation, we look at the deviation of the, of the feature vectors HI from, from their corresponding class mean. And we look at the average over all examples and over all classes. And we keep track of how this metric evolves over the training epochs. Okay? And we do so for two data sets, for CIFARTER and MNIST. And what you see here is that this metric 
goes down over training, right? Um, suggesting that indeed the embeddings uh, as the network uh, trains uh, longer and longer converts to their, to their mean. Okay, now what about the geometry? Uh, in order to check the ETF geometry, you, one way to do it, and there's many ways to do that, could, could be to, to look at the gram matrix, the normalized gram matrix, and compare it to what theory suggests. The theory here is rather hypothesis or conjecture, right? And so the, the, the theory value here is this uh, identity minus the rank one component matrix. Uh, and so again, you, you can observe that um, as training progresses, this metric goes down, okay? Uh, and this is true both for CIFAR and MNIST, um, and is also true for the, for the embeddings. Now you can see that for the embeddings, you have a little bit worse convergence, um, but still the trend, um, the trend is there. Okay, so, uh, so what are the highlights of this result? Uh, it has two nice features, right? So the first one is that, is that it's very, very simple, right? It's a very, very simple description. And if you, if you look at their paper, they also do experiments for other data sets and for other, for other architectures. And, and, and the second important uh, result is that it's cross-situationally invariant, right? So it holds for CIFAR and it holds for MNIST and it holds for, um, uh, for FASION, MNIST and, and so on. And the only real restriction here is that all classes have the same number of examples. Okay, that's the requirement and that's in all their, uh, their experiments. And so what I want to ask here is what if the data are imbalanced? Okay, so what, specifically what if classes are imbalanced? Now why am I even asking this question? Uh, it's, it's not only a matter of just to do something. Okay, so, so here are three reasons why I think it's meaningful and important to look at imbalanced data sets. First of all, imbalances are more frequent than not. Uh, uh, second, uh, this geometry, as you noted, is very, very symmetric, right? So, so I think it's, it's, it's good once you have such a result to try to understand how brittle it is to, 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 to changing the, the structure or the, the, the symmetry in, in, in your data, right? And so is, the, is this something that only occurs in very symmetric situations or is it possible to find such structural properties even when we break the symmetry? Um, and the last, the last motivation is something that um, um, we're not there yet, but, but I'm hoping that um, by understanding such structural properties for, for other scenarios as well, perhaps there could be a link between this geometry and generalization, which is, of course, that holy grail. Um, and, and, and I can say uh, maybe one more word afterwards uh, about this link. All right, so, uh, so here's the specific setting that, that we'll be looking at. So we have step imbalanced data sets. So uh, it's, it's a particular case of, of generic class imbalance where there is only a minority fraction row of, of, uh, of classes that have a number of examples that uh, I denote here by n mean, and then majorities have a number of examples that are denoted by r times n mean. So r here is the imbalance ratio. Um, and so really what we want to know is how does this geometry change as a function of R and the minority uh, fraction. And so here is our uh, hypothesis, our conjecture, okay? Uh, so we say that the geometry is characterized by the following two properties. The first property doesn't change, so NC property stays the same. And then we, we propose uh, uh, to substitute the ETF property with something that we call the Selly property, uh, standing for simplex encoded labels interpolations. Uh, and this is a more general geometry that boils down to the ETF geometry when you, uh, when you consider um, the balanced case. Okay, so, so let me show you an instance of how this geometry looks like for, for an example where I have four classes and um, two of them are majorities, two of them are minorities, and I have an imbalance ratio of R equal to 10. Um, so you see here that there is um, eight vectors plotted in total. There's four for the classifiers in red, four for the embeddings in blue, and then there is two for majorities and two for minorities. Now the first thing that you observe here is that the, the, the symmetry is, is, uh, is broken, okay? Uh, so first of all, the, the classifiers and the embeddings do not align anymore. And also you see that there's different behavior uh, with respect to angles and norms when it comes to minorities versus majorities, okay? So for example, uh, you can see that um, classifier majorities uh, have larger norms than uh, classifier minorities, okay, according to this, uh, to this geometry. All right, and I'll tell you how we come up with this geometry, but before I do that, does this work? Okay, so here is an experiment uh, where what we're looking at is we are, we are uh, during training, we are um, 
we are measuring the average of the ratio of the uh, majority classifiers over the minority classifiers in terms of norms um, as training uh, progresses. And we compare this to the theoretical value, where theoretical value takes the value of one if the ETF under the ETF conjecture, it takes and takes a different value under the Selly conjecture. Okay, so so the comparison to the to the Selly uh, geometry is given in, in solid line here, and comparison to the ETF geometry is given in dust line. And what you see here is that when I compare to the Selly geometry, the, the curves do go down, but when I compare to the ETF geometry, they 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 go up, right? Uh, so clearly they converge better here to the to the Selly geometry. Now, um, this is about the norms. What about angles and, um, and embeddings? Uh, here is the comparison for the gram matrices. Um, so you see here, again, we're doing the same, the same experiment, and we're doing it for CIFARTER and TEMNIST with, with ResNet 18, and um, for imbalance ratios of R equal to 1, corresponds to the balanced case, by the way. Uh, this is why there's no blue dust line, because ETF and CELI are the same here. Uh, R equal to 5, R equal to 10, and R equal to 100. Um, and so note here that all these curves do go down. Um, the same is true for embeddings, but for embeddings we do observe uh, that convergence worsens. And in fact, it worsens with increased imbalance. So that's, that's something that, um, at least in these in this experiments, um, seems to be the case. Um, and all right, I, I, could, I could show you some more of these uh, pictures, but, uh, but now before I do that, and I could show you some more of this offline perhaps. Let me tell you a little bit about where does this Selly geometry comes from. So in order to, to describe the Selly geometry, I need to define only one object, which is this simplex encoded label matrix. So this is a K times N matrix. Remember that K is the number of classes, N is the number of samples. Uh, so this is, this is a matrix that looks like that, and each column corresponds to one example. So what I've done here is uh, I'm, I'm showing you how this matrix looks like for, uh, for the case of, of an, uh, where I have four classes. Uh, and every row corresponds to one of these classes. Uh, and every column corresponds to one of the examples. And what I've done here is without loss of generality, I've, I've taken the first 50 examples to belong to class one, the other 50 to class two, and, and, and so on. And this, the, 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 the feature of this matrix is that it only takes, the entries only take two values. The first value is k minus one over k, and the other value is minus one over k, okay? And it takes the value k minus one over k if the example belongs to that class. So essentially, this is an encoding matrix, right? It's, it's, not a, it's nothing but the one-hot encoding, the, the, the standard one-hot encoding matrix, uh, centered with this one, one transpose, okay? Uh, and so why do I care about this uh, cell matrix? Uh, because the, the cell geometry is defined according to the SVD factorization of this matrix, okay? Um, so you take this, this um, Z hat, you form its SVD, and then the, the hypothesis is that W transpose W will converge to, uh, to V lambda V transpose and correspondingly for, for the embeddings, okay? So this is the description of the, of the geometry. Okay, uh, so... Uh, and, 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 and really this is, this is where this, this picture came from. In fact, it is possible to compute these uh, SVD factors in closed form, which is kind of pleasing because it means that we can get um, uh, exact uh, formulas for the ratios in terms of the imbalance ratio and in terms of the, of the minority fraction. And here I'm just showing you the example for minority fraction to be one half. And so really when I showed you this plot where I was comparing the ratio of majorities to minority norms, and I had this theory formula, this was the theory formula that I was evaluating, right? And you see the dependence on the imbalance ratio and on the, on the number of samples. Okay, um, okay, uh, and this is again what, what I saw. All right, so, so last thing, where does this come from, right? So uh, if you have a guess for the, geometry, or for the geometry, then checking it through experiments is easy. And I'm putting easy in quote marks here because to anyone who has done these experiments, you know, it, it takes some effort, um, but but really, for our purposes, the, the 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 big question was how to come up with this geometry at first place. Okay, um, and and I think in in the original work by Papian, Han, and Donohoe, uh, what I think is is the more uh, uh, 
at, at least to me, surprising, surprising in, in their papers, how did they come up with this, with this formalization, right? Um, all right, um, so, so here is how um, we do this. So we use something that is called the unconstrained features model, which essentially views the rest of the neural network as a black box and just focuses on the embeddings and the classifiers. So this is something, this is a model that was um, uh, proposed um, in, in several contemporaneous works just after the original paper by Papian Han and Donohoe, um, and, and, and the model essentially what it says is, is that you should treat all layers, but the last as a, as a, black, as a black box that can generate unconstrained features uh, that are very powerful, right? And so essentially when you look at your cross entropy minimization, what you're doing now is you're minimizing over the classifiers W, and you're minimizing over the embeddings without any restrictions on the embeddings. So note here that embeddings are now no more parameterized by some theta that depends on the previous networks. So I have this, this non-convex optimization now. Uh, and so the, these papers, what they did is they introduced this model and they used it in order to study, to, to explain the neural collapse phenomenon in the case where I have uh, balanced, uh, balanced uh, data. And so in the balanced data case, everything is symmetric and aligned. And so essentially in all these papers, and again, there's, there's several of them. I've highlighted the one that um, at least um, I found um, um, uh, that their analysis was, was very transparent um, and, and motivated much of our work. Um, uh, so, so the proof, but, but in all of them, the proof more or less goes like that. So you take this, this cross entropy loss and you successively apply Cauchy's Vars and Jensen lower bounds. Uh, you get a, lo a lower bound on, 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 on the cross entropy loss, and then you show that the qualities and, uh, are satisfied if and only if the ETF geometry holds. Okay, and again, because everything is symmetric, it makes sense that that it uh, it goes well with Cauchy's Vars and Jensen, right? Everything is aligned, and at the end of the day, in this case, you know what you want to prove, right? So, so perhaps also that that helps the analysis a little bit. In our case, at least, there's no symmetry, there's no alignment, and um, it's not a priori clear what, what is to prove, right? What, what, is, what is the geometry? So what is the answer? All right, and, and, and so we, we, we take a somewhat different route than, than directly lower bounding the, the cross entropy loss. Uh, so we have a sequence of, um, of results analyzing this, this cross entropy loss. So, so the, first, the first result is that, the first realization is that once you allow for imbalances and multi-class, so, uh, then the geometry of the solutions changes with regularization. So in the balanced case and in binary case, this is something that does not occur, okay? So you, you have to have imbalances in multi-class in order to see, this, to see this, this behavior of the solution changing with lambda. So this is why I call this imbalanced trouble at the end of the day. Uh, and, and, and the but the current practice in neural network training is that lambda is negligible, okay? And so what if we look at the limit of lambda going to, to zero, okay? So this is kind of the regularization path as, as lambda goes to zero. It is related to, to the implicit bias analysis of gradient descent, uh, but it's something weaker. Um, and so, and so what, what we saw here is that if you take lambda to go, going to zero, then the, the global optimum of this um, reads regularized cross entropy loss minimization converges to this max margin uh, problem. This is a non-convex uh, max margin problem. We call this the, the UFSVM, standing for unconstrained feature support vector machine. Um, and really, uh, now, um, the, the claim is that um, perhaps we should be trying to understand what is the global optimum of this, of this problem, okay? And so this is what, uh, what the result shows, that as provided that the dimension is, 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 is larger than um, k minus 1, where k is the number of classes, then, um, then the logits, um, the optimal logits that are being learned by this support vector machine are equal to this simplex encoded label matrix, Okay, so essentially, if I view this um, logic as the learned model, um, then, then I'm interpolating a label matrix that is encoded according, according to the simplex constraints, and this is motivating the, the name of Selly matrix. And then, and then number two property is that the gram matrices have this, uh, this property that they are dependent on the SVD factors of, of Z hat. And so essentially, um, according to the definition of the cell geometry, uh, this, this shows that the, the, the solution, the global optimum of, of, of this non-convex problem uh, uh, follows the, the cell geometry. Now, um, how does the proof go? Well, um, we use a rather standard convex relaxation um, um, 
which uh, which substitutes the the, the non-convex uh, rather which substitutes the objective uh, with with a with a nuclear norm of of the logit. So essentially, kind of the insight here is that you should be looking at the logit, uh, and so we have this convex relaxation, and here. Um, the, the, the bulk of the proof is showing through an explicit construction of dual certificate that, that, that Z had that this cell matrix is, is, the, is the global optimum and then, and then using this to show that the relaxation is, uh, is tight. Um, okay, so um, I don't know if I have time to go through that. Um, maybe maybe I, quickly, I quickly say that uh, up to now we've only uh, characterized the global optimum of this non-convex SVM. Um, one question is whether uh, gradient descent converges to that. Um, and so it is possible to, to view this unconstrained feature model as a two-layer linear model on a specific input. Essentially, in particular, this is the standard basis input. And so according to previous works by Liu and Li and Zian Telgarski, uh, it is known that gradient descent will converge to a stationary point of this UFSVM. Now, is this stationary point a global optimum? Um, in the binary case, yes, um, by previous results. In the balanced case, yes. In the balanced case, um, I don't know of, of, of a former result. If, if anyone knows, I'd be happy to know about it. Uh, but ex and the experiment suggests that this is the case. But there is something interesting here, which is that convergence slows down with increasing imbalance. Um, and so I think that, that that might be something that is interesting to investigate uh, theoretically. Um, and, and, and again, th these are just experiments where we run gradient descent on, um, can also run gradient descent on cross entropy loss and, and measuring distance to, to Selly uh, geometry. Okay, so I will, I will end here with this um, slide that is um, just summarizing our, um, our hypothesis and, and our findings and, and the motivation of, for why to look at imbalanced data sets. Thank you. Questions? Thanks a lot for the interesting talk. I was just wondering, um, have you looked at or tried experiments with non-cross entropy loss, like a poly loss type or like a square loss, or would you still see something like this happen? No, we, we, we have not. We have not. And, and that, that, that's a good point. Um, this is something that people have looked in the... So let me say maybe one word that um, there's a lot of follow-up work on the neural collapse paper. Um, and th people have looked at various things. One of the things that has been looked is, is whether the same uh, geometry occurs if you run, uh, if you optimize square loss. Uh, I don't know about polynomial decaying losses. And that for the square loss, it does, is the same? Then. Yeah, for, for oh. square losses, it's yeah. the same. And then there's okay. a corresponding theoretical analysis using, again, the unconstrained uh, features model. Why I'm wondering is just in the in the case of imbalanced data that it might be useful to use a different loss. If yeah, no, a, a, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And and this is some this is why also I say that at the end of the day I'm I'm hoping that also perhaps there's something about generalization if there is any link, because once you have imbalances then generalization gets worse. So now we have these different geometries with different generalizations. Could there be a link? Other questions? Thanks for the talk. Is there a nice uh, uh, geometric effect known also in the case of regression, like the normal collapse, something of this nature? I mean, this looks specific to classification, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if you can tell uh, a bit more about generalization. So in particular, do I see the same effect if I train on uh, la random labels and, uh, uh, and so, or, or not? Yeah, very, very good question. Uh, so this is, this is I, I would say, one of the two missing experiments for us to publish the archive paper. Uh, so we do want to run experiments on, on, on random labels. Uh, to see whether the same the same occurs. For now, we've uh, we've run experiments on ResNet 18 and VGG uh, with Amnesty and Cipher. But in, in terms of experiments, um, there's there's definitely more work that uh, that can be done here. 
Um, and because I, there is, there is, um, there is certain things that, that um, for example, as I showed you, that convergence gets slower for, for embeddings, and it gets slower as you increase the imbalance ratio. So I think that this is something that, um, that should be investigated more. And uh, we'll do our best to investigate at some point, and then I'm hoping that there is more interest in that. Then, if there are no other questions, I think we can move on and thank Christos again. Thank you.